Could the secret to healthy aging be bacteria? Scientists have been learning a lot about how our gut health is integral to our brain and our overall health. And this week's episode, I'm going to be talking to you about the gut microbiome, what it is and how to keep yours healthy. Welcome to This Is Getting Old, Moving Towards an Age-Friendly World. I'm Dr. Melissa Bachelor, and I'm a nurse and a nurse practitioner with over 25 years of experience caring for older adults and their families. And before we dive into today's topic, I just wanted to share a few of the different ways that you can connect with me. You can go to my website, melissabphd.com, and sign up to be an HYSU Insider for free. There you'll find all of my download, um, downloadable handouts that I've developed in one place. And if you become an HYSU MVP member, you'll also have access to a digital hub of videos, courses, and resources that I've organized by subtopics, which makes it even easier for you to find information that you're looking for. And I also host a monthly live Q&A webinar for my MVP members. But you can also become a member on YouTube. And depending on your membership level, you can get early access to the weekly podcast episodes. You can join me for a monthly live Q&A webinar and tune in weekly for um, a live stream with me on Tuesdays at 5. So thank you for joining me today. Um, and what I'm going to do today is do a very high level overview of the gut microbiome and its impact on aging. So we're going to talk about what it is, what it does and how to protect and optimize your gut microbiome. Um, because when it's functioning well, you c- it can help to prevent disease and help us age overall better. So the gut microbiome is believed to hold the key to healthy aging, both as an indicator of health and by the influence it has on our immune system and the body's ability to naturally repair itself. So studying the gut microbiome um, is actually an evolving scientific field. Um, I recently watched a documentary on Netflix titled Hack Your Health, The Secrets of Your Gut, and I highly recommend that you check it out if you haven't seen it already. And I also recommend listening to one of Mel Robbins' podcast episodes with Dr. Robin um, Chukan, who is a gastroenterologist out of Georgetown. Um, Both the Netflix um, video is really good about showing you visually kind of how the gut microbiome works and all the different players. And sometimes that's easier than just kind of talking about it um, theoretically. So what is the gut microbiome? Well, over the past 15 years, scientists have made a lot of advancements in understanding the impact that the gut microbiome has on our health. And so it's often been described as the newest discovered body organ. And the gut microbiome is made up of bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and other microbes that are naturally in our digestive system. In a nutshell, you could think of your gut microbiome as a diverse garden that you rely on for nutritious foods and medicines. When your garden is thriving, you thrive. But if the soil is depleted, polluted, or pests or weeds overrun your helpful plants in your garden, it can upset the entire ecosystem. The microorganisms in your gut should live in symbiosis, meaning there's a mutually beneficial relationship between our health and the health of these organisms. And each person's balance and mix of these microbes is unique, and it's affected by early life exposures from the point of birth, when you pass through the birth canal, you pick up microbes from your mom that end up in your digestive tract after that. It also depends on how hygienic your environment has been as you grow up. Um, in fact, there's a hygiene hypothesis, meaning that we're maybe keeping ourselves a little bit too clean, and that's not been good for our overall gut microbiome. But also the things that we eat, the environment that we live in, the, and including the geography of where we live and our socioeconomic status all impact our gut microbiome. And then the gut microbiome also changes over the course of our lifespan. The digestive system is made up of our mouth, our esophagus, our stomach, and our small and large intestines. Um, And you have microbes in your stomach and in your small intestines, but most of our gut bacteria are in our large intestines. And when we eat certain high fiber foods like whole grains, fruits, and vegetables, we may be able to reduce inflammation in our body. Certain gut bacteria convert these foods into compounds called short-chain fatty acids, and they have both an anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer properties. Short-chain fatty acids also feed the cells in our gut lining to make sure um, to help maintain our gut barrier, and that keeps the bacteria and the toxins inside the digestive system that keeps them from escaping and getting into your bloodstream. And the Netflix documentary really does a really good job of explaining 
all of that um, visually with the little cartoon-like characters. So our gut bacteria also play a role in digestion, um, and they have a role in our immune system, our nervous system, our endocrine system, and have been linked to depression, dementia, cancers, allergies, schizophrenia, and rheumatoid arthritis, just to name a few. And they influence both the start of these diseases, but also the system, the symptom intensity as the disease progresses. So what does the gut microbiome do? Well, our body needs more than 37 trillion microbes to protect us against pathogens. They also break down essential nutrients and they convert these raw materials for proper immune function. So while genes and physical activity play a role in our health or illness risk, research is now suggesting that another key factor at play is, is that it also reduces our risk of heart disease, diabetes, and obesity. And most of these diseases are characterized by continual low-grade inflammation, which is actually what got me um, interested and started um, kind of down this path. Um, it all started with, you know, what is an anti-inflammatory diet? How do, how, what role does inflammation play in disease? Um, and so the latest section of um, this kind of journey has included the gut microbiome. Uh, the gut microbiome also produces essential enzymes, neurotransmitters, and vitamins. And neurotransmitters, we typically think about are, are in our brain, like serotonin, dopamine, but they actually start in the gut. So the gut is often referred to as like as the second brain. So the gut microbiome produces these essential enzymes, neurotransmitters, and vitamins. And these either help or hinder our gut microbiome's ability to trigger or calm an inflammatory response by our immune system. And like I said earlier, the bacteria in our gut help break down dietary fibers and certain complex carbohydrates into these short-chain fatty acids. And then they provide the enzymes needed to synthesize certain vitamins like vitamin K, B1, B9, and B12. And if your body isn't able to synthesize those vitamins, then you end up with a micronutrient deficiency. So this is B12 deficiency, a folate or a vitamin K deficiency. What are some signs that your gut microbiome might be unbalanced? Well, ideally, our gut microbiome is in a healthy balance. If you have low levels of the good microbe or high levels of the bad microbes, it creates an imbalance known as um, dysbiosis. And I had not actually heard this term until Probably a year ago, um, I started seeing integrative and functional medicine. And one of the tests that he did for me was looking at my gut health because I was concerned that I wasn't, my body wasn't absorbing the micronutrients that I needed. So dysbiosis um, can be triggered by genetics, lifestyle factors, diet, like what we're eating, medications that we take. Um, if we have any infectious pathogens, like an overgrowth of yeast um, or environmental factors. So signs that your gut microbiome is likely out of balance include things like being constipated or having diarrhea or having a lot of gas or bloating. So if you're dealing with any of these issues, it's always a good idea to get in to see your provider because they could be um, symptoms of a larger issue that's not related to the gut microbiome. So what can you do? Well, the first thing that you can do is to clean up your diet. One of the primary ways that I've been trying to do this is to eat a lot of different plant-based foods. So this means plenty of fruits and vegetables, because when we do that, we keep our gut microbiome balanced. And the, docu the documentary recommended to always be counting um, with the goal of eating at least 30 servings of fruit and vegetables each week. So I think, first of all, knowing what a serving of a fruit or vegetable is. Um, and then be sure that you're counting those. And I think a lot of times we also get into the habit of eating the same foods all the time. Like when I go to the grocery store, I know what fruits my kids will eat and what vegetables they'll eat. So I tend to buy only those things, but maybe try to um, identify one new fruit or vegetable each week um, that you can introduce into your diet. You also want to be sure that you're eating enough fiber. Um, and to avoid processed foods as much as possible. Um, you can also try prebiotics, probiotics, or symbiotics. And these, this was also, I'd heard of probiotics before, but never really, had, I don't think I'd really heard the term of prebiotics until a couple of weeks ago. Um, but prebiotics are the dietary fibers that feed your helpful gut bacteria. So this is another reason why fiber is good in our diet. 
Um, but it's basically the food that your gut microorganisms need to survive. Probiotics are the live microbes that you can eat um, or take through a supplement. And examples of this include fermented foods like kimchi, pickles, sauerkraut, and yogurt. And then symbiotics are actually the commercially prepared mixture of both pre and probiotics. But um, the Mel Robbins podcast with that gastroenterologist said that you want to just be really careful of the type of microbes that you're, or the type of probiotics that you're eating, um, because they can't actually overrun your good bacteria or make a more hostile gut environment for your for your own microbes. So, my personally, I don't um, do probiotics. Um, but so I'm just giving you information there. But my advice really is um, to just eat healthy whole foods. And by that, I mean single ingredient foods. So again, foods that come in their own wrapper. Um, so like a banana, orange, you know, and individual uh, vegetables. But again, you can mix those together and create really um, great dishes. And there's a ton of recipes online for, for doing that. So you want to eat single ingredient foods rather than eating processed foods. The second thing is you want to be sure that you're having regular bowel movements. And if you're already eating a diet high in fruits and vegetables um, and fiber, the next best thing to do is to make sure that you're drinking plenty of water each day um, and make sure that you're getting in some physical activity because, um, you know, anytime somebody's been in the bed um, or if you're not physically active, it makes it harder for everything um, to move and you need the water to lubricate everything. Um, the third thing is to avoid chemicals like alcohol, tobacco, smoke, and pollutants. Um, some of that you can control if you live in a high high air pollution environment. That's not as easy for you to control, um, but there have been uh, actually some recent studies that I um, heard on the news the other day, like that now they're saying no alcohol is good for us. We all know the, um, the perils of tobacco smoke, um, and even there was something on the news last week too about um, you know people that eat a, a diet higher in highly processed foods tend to have um, more negative health um, outcomes than when you eat a whole plant based diet. Um, although the podcast with um, Mel Robbins and the gastroenterologist, um, she was talking about some studies that you don't even have to be like vegan or vegetarian. You know, you, if you get your protein through animal products, um, as long as you are mixing that in with your fruits and vegetables, um, that that's going to be good for your, it's still going to be good for your gut microbiome. And then the last suggestion is to use antibiotics with care. Um, if you need, if you need to take an antibiotic, then you just have, then you need to take one. Um, but a lot of times you don't need to take an antibiotic. So being sure that you, that the provider that you're working with, knows why they're giving you that antibiotic and they're giving you the right bug for the right drug. Because when we overuse antibiotics, it leads to antibiotic resistance. And antibiotics not only kill our good bacteria, but they kill um, while they're killing the bad. Um, but they can upset the balance of your gut microbiome and actually lead to the wrong kind of bacteria actually coming back stronger. So that's just our introduction today into the gut microbiome. Um, don't forget to go to my website, melissabphd.com backslash join. You become an HYSU Insider or MVP member. You can also become a member on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast if you haven't already on whatever platform you're joining me from today. And if you have found this information helpful, please like it, um, share it with someone who you think might be having some issues with their gut, um, and please leave a five-star rating. Um, because all those things help um, the, this information get out to people that it would be helpful for. So until next time, be well.